What Jesus is saying is that you've drunk from something that I have measured out. I mean, we're talking about a dose here, and mm -hmm. dose is very important in the nature of the psychedelic experience. And here Jesus is saying that we're having a transpersonal experience. You're becoming me, I'm becoming you. This is the Heath in Pursuit podcast with Heath Hollinsby. Each week we'll have a conversation with various folks who are actively engaged in the pursuit of truth. This is a show where anything can be discussed and probably will. A podcast for the seekers, the dreamers, the restless, the hurt and the broken. This is a podcast for you. Welcome to Heath in Pursuit. Thank you, James. Welcome to another edition of Heath in Pursuit. I am Heath Hollinsby, and I, for the next hour, will be your shaman or your instructor as we talk about a very unique subject, which is magic mushrooms. Um, and I'm really excited about today's show. Uh, and I kind of started getting curious about mushrooms, not necessarily the, the psilocybin or the psychedelic uh, type of mushrooms, but um, it came from, I watched a movie actually on New Year's Day called Fantastic Fungi in the theaters, and it was just mind-blowing on how connected we are, how mushrooms, like mycelium, draws us all together, uh, the use of mushrooms in treatments for various mental illnesses, and I thought, wow, this is a really interesting topic, and then I watched a Goop Lab episode with Gwyneth Paltrow on Netflix, um, I think it was episode number one of season one, where they sent a couple of their staffers down to the Caribbean to partake of a mushroom trip with the guided care of shamans and uh, some healers, and there were some really significant results there, and I just thought, wow, this is this is a world that I have not had any conversations about. And uh, I found a, a couple books on it from a religious perspective that I thought were really fascinating. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. But I just wanted to preface where we're going today, give you some definitions. For those of you who are like, whoa, magic mushrooms, this is a little uh, 1960s or 70s even. I don't know if I'm comfortable talking about this. I hope that the conversation today can ease some of those uh, maybe tensions in your mind. So I'm going to start with... Um, Maybe some definitions to help us out, right? Things we'll be talking about. So psilocybin, you're going to hear about that today. That's a naturally occurring psychedelic prodrug compound produced uh, by more than 200 different types of mushrooms, different species of mushrooms. And they're, uh, so that's a naturally occurring, there's no weird lab sort of stuff going in. It just found in some weird mushrooms. Mycelium um, is the fungus that mushrooms are actually made of, but it also can produce everything from plastics to plant-based meat to scaffolding for growing organs. And uh, there's really some fascinating stuff being done with mycelium, but it's the, uh, the, the sole purpose of mycelium is to extend the area in which a fungi can find nutrients. So fungi are naturally stationary organisms, but mycelium, they grow outwards to look for water. They're like the roots of the mushroom, and they're looking for nutrients like nitrogen and carbon, potassium, phosphorus. Um, and so mycelium transports uh, those various nutrients to the fruiting body so it can continue to uh, produce biomass and grow. Um, a couple of things you should know, uh, currently in America, apart from Denver, which is the first city to decriminalize mushrooms, um, it's a Schedule One drug, according to the Drug Enforcement Administration, because they don't see it having uh, any accepted medical use currently, and they also see it as a high potential for abuse. Um, those, those studies are still being tested. Uh, other drugs in that category are like marijuana, ecstasy, LSD, that sort of stuff. But what people are finding is that there's some really cool uh, health benefits of mushrooms on the brain. So in one study, researchers scanned the brains of 15 volunteers after giving them psilocybin, and there were some major activity spikes in the brain network that were linked to emotional thinking uh, with simultaneous activity in different areas like the hippocampus and anterior cingulate cortex. Um, this pattern resembles fMRI scans of people who are dreaming, the researchers noted. So at the same time, activity became less organized in the brain network linked with high-level thinking and a sense of self. Um, another MRI study found a dramatic change in brain organization linking psilocybin with a temporary flurry of neural connections that don't normally exist. Researchers said that we find that the psychedelic state is associated with a less constrained and more intercommunicative mode of brain function. 
the authors of that study wrote, which is consistent with descriptions of the nature of consciousness in the psychedelic state. Um, there's a team of researchers from the University of South Florida who discovered that psilocybin can bind itself to receptors that stimulate healing in the brain, and therefore it's believed that psilocybin repairs and grows brain cells, which could prove beneficial to those who suffer from depression or other mental health problems. And that's actually happening right now. There's millions of Americans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, including hundreds of thousands of veterans. And standard drug and therapy treatments have mixed success rates. Some cases of PTSD are considered actually untreatable. But researchers are seeing really dramatic results from therapy that use psychedelic drugs to treat PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And that includes the psilocybin found in mushrooms and also ecstasy. Um, those are those two specifically are showing an eighty percent success rate years after treatment. So there's a lot of there's a lot of information there, and I know I kind of fire hosed it here at the beginning. But today's guest is Dr. Jerry Brown, who's an anthropologist and he's an author and an activist. Um, from 1972 to 2014, he actually served as a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, where he designed and taught a course on hallucinogens and culture. And Professor Brown, uh, he writes on psychedelics and religion. Uh, He's a lead co-author of Sacred Plants in the Gnostic Church, Speculations of Entheogen Use in Early Christian Ritual. Um, He wrote a book called The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity with his wife. He received his doctorate degree in anthropology from Cornell University. And uh, if you're interested in what we're about to talk about, uh, they are on social media. Um... The website is www.psychedelicgospels.com. Facebook, if you just search Psychedelic Gospels. Uh, Twitter, it's PSY Gospels. So at PSY Gospels. Um, but uh, him and his wife's book, The Psychedelic Gospels The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity, is available on Amazon. Um, and I would encourage you to read it because it's a pretty fascinating read. And I've watched a couple of his teachings on on mushrooms and Christian art and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to get into that right now. Dr. Jerry Brown, who's actively joining us from Portugal right now, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us on Heath and Pursuit. Pleasure to be here. You know, um, your book, The Psychedelic Gospels, you, you, you've you you've got a bunch of research out on, uh, and I'm excited to talk about where your history has been and some of the research you've done. But um, as I set up the show, uh, I did kind of let the audience know kind of where we're going. And so I'm going to just jump in. We've talked about some questions to chat through. And I'm just curious, um, from your research and from much of your studies, which is really great, what evidence do you present to support the controversial claims that psychedelics played a role in the history of Christianity and that they might even offer an alternative explanation of Jesus's awakening to his divinity and immortality. Like, do you believe that Christianity has a psychedelic? Uh, based on our research and the research of others in the area that have looked at images of psychedelic mushrooms, both Amanita, uh, Muscaria mushrooms, and psilocybin variety mushrooms in Christian art, And by this, I mean in early and medieval Christian art, uh, images found in tiny chapels, in parish churches, in cathedrals, in abbeys, uh, images including um, frescoes, wall paintings, Mm. stained glass windows, mosaics, that there is an emerging compelling evidence that Christianity has a psychedelic Uh, history, and the evidence for it is found in these uh, images that were placed in in Christian art in early and medieval uh, times. My wife and co-author Julie and I traveled through Scotland, England, France, Germany, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and the Middle East, uh, collecting these images, which are presented uh, in our book. We've seen uh, images of uh, Adam and Eve standing side by side around a giant Amanita mushroom that's led us to a reinterpretation of the Genesis myth Mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden. Um, We found in a tiny uh, church, St. Martin de Vic in France, about the uh, 12th century, um, a a whole Christology, uh, life of Christ based and involving 
psilocybin mushrooms in a, in a fresco there uh, that shows Jesus's entry into Jerusalem, the joyful youth who are welcoming him are holding on to the stem of um, a five uh, round tan psilocybin mushrooms. Hmm. Jesus is walking, is, is on the um, ass, he's going towards the towers of Jerusalem. On the top of those towers of Jerusalem, we find uh, the joyful youth cutting down mushrooms. And lo and behold, this is over another fresco uh, showing the Last Supper with uh, slices of mushrooms on the table and mushrooms cleverly drawn into the hems of the disciples. We wow. also found psychedelic image mushrooms in, in the high holy places, in Canterbury Cathedral, in Shark Cathedral, in St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany, which was created by Bishop Bernward, who was the tutor to Otto III, the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. Hmm. And Bishop Bernward was later sainted by the Catholic Church. So this is not something that's simply uh, marginal. Yeah. And we recall that uh, Pope Gregory in the sixth century said, let art be the Bible uh, for the illiterate. And most mm -hmm. of the people in those times were illiterate. So we feel there is a growing body of iconographic visual evidence of uh, psychedelic mushroom images into Christian art. When we get back to the time of Jesus and the disciples, well, before 200 uh, AD, there is no Christian art, for example, for a variety of reasons, poverty, persecution. So we need to look into the, uh, the gospels themselves and into the Gnostic gospels for textual evidence. And I'll cite you one example uh, from the um, Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Okay. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, and this was not written by Thomas, but it's the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Sure. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, and I quote, compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Mm. Jesus said, I am not your master because you have drunk. You have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring, which I have measured out. He who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I shall become he and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Now, this is a remarkable passage because what Jesus is saying is that you've drunk from something that I have measured out. I mean, we're talking about a dose here, and mm. dose is very important in the nature of the psychedelic experience. And here Jesus is saying that we're having a transpersonal experience. You're becoming me, I'm becoming you, and the things that are hidden are hidden will be revealed. And remember that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within. So yeah. we think this is one of several direct references that can be interpreted as a psychedelic uh, experience. Uh, this is both, we find that there is textual evidence and iconographic uh, art evidence for mm -hmm. uh, the psychedelic uh, gospels. And this is what we base our, our claim that there is a psychedelic for his, history of Christianity on. Yeah, you know, I think what's fascinating there, Jerry, is something you said just really relates to my kind of personal heart in that, um, you know, as I as I mentioned even offline, I'm, I'm currently writing my dissertation for my doctorate degree, and it's all about how um, artists in the church and art through the history of the church. And so, you know, a lot of people would be prone to typically write this off, like, well, this can't be a hallucinogenic, maybe it's maybe it's not really a mushroom, but, but early Christian artists, especially those who were responsible for decorating cathedrals with stained glass and stuff, you're absolutely right, because there was no you didn't have a literate culture. And before the printing press, you didn't have the text as the primary uh, way of understanding a special revelation to God. It was really done through the arts. So the fact that we're looking at cathedrals and stuff that are 
ancient and purposed and purposeful in what art was being displayed, you have to imagine that these artists were very intentional. And if you're finding mushrooms in some of that art now, it was a lot more uh, maybe well-received or spoken about or common phrase in the history of the early church than we would typically see it like in today's form. Sure. We, um, we don't know who was responsible for these images. Was it the artists themselves? Was it the church fathers who oversaw and directed the artists what to paint? Sure. Was it the patrons, including the pagan elite, because paganism and Christianity existed side by side in those times? Or was it all three of them together that created the stained glass windows of the famous Shark Cathedral where we found psychedelic mushroom images in 7% of the 176 magnificent stained glass windows wow. in Chartres Cathedral. Uh, as I said, in the case of Bishop Bernward in, in Hildesheim, St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany, we do know directly uh, who created that art. So this is obviously not as some people have suggested, something that was suppressed by Christianity. We believe it was well known at least to the elite of Christianity. And these mushrooms were uh, put there as a guide for the initiates mm. to have a direct experience of the divine. Uh, you said that the prime example of the relation between the serpent and the mushroom, of course, in the Garden of Eden, is in the Old Testament. The cunning reptile prevails upon Eve and her husband to eat of the tree whose fruit made them as gods, knowing good and evil. And you say that the whole Eden story is mushroom-based mythology, not least in the identity of the tree as a sacred fungus. And I'm wondering if you could talk about this a bit, because the more research I did, I look at like early mushrooms, and some of those actually grew as trees, 9, 10, 12 feet tall. Um, where are you seeing mushrooms in Genesis? Well, here, and, and this quote is from John Marco Allegro, who wrote a book called The Sacred Mushroom Then the Cross back in uh, 1970. And it was the, uh, he used, uh, he worked mainly on ancient scriptures and his work, which we do not endorse in general, was very con controversial because he argued that the entire Old and New Testament was a metaphor for the mushroom. We do not believe that, but okay. we do believe that the, um, image that's found in the um, ancient church, uh, medieval church of Plain Corral in, uh, in the center of France was an Amanita muscaria mushroom. This mm. is a giant mushroom. It's taller than Adam and Eve. Uh, and in medieval art, um, size mattered. Sure. Uh, it shows two moments, and this is all found. You can find this. Uh, obviously, these are color plates in our book, original photographs, yeah. all of which were taken by my wife and co-author. This image, the temptation in the Garden of Eden in the chapel of Plain Corralt in central France from 1291, uh, shows two moments from the Garden of Eden scene. One mm -hmm is the temptation because the serpent is holding out a mushroom cap to Eve. And also it shows that they have ingested the mushroom because Adam and Eve are covering themselves already. Mm. And what they're covering themselves is obviously not a fig leaf. It's round and it's not in the jagged shape of a fig leaf. Mm. So we believe uh, as Allegro did that this was a, uh, an indication that even back in the Old Testament, they were aware of the incredible power of the mushroom uh, images. Yeah. Really uh, we would take this one step forward further because some people have said, well, this is all about the fall. But the fall comes only in to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there was no such thing as the fall. Hmm. Uh, there was this um, temptation in Eden. God says, you know, uh, enjoy Eden. You have dominion over all the things and uh, you, you know, can enjoy all the fruits. But of one of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, shall not eat thereof. 
for if you do, then surely you shall die. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. God does not execute Adam and Eve. And we think what is really going on here is an understanding that Eve is not the person, the weak-willed person who allowed sin into God's perfect world, uh, which is a, a paradox in itself. How does sin show up so early yeah. in God's creation and if God's creation were perfect, but rather is the spiritual guide who through the mushrooms led humanity onto the path of higher consciousness. Wow. That, okay, so I'm curious then, um, in light of that, what was the role of psychedelic plants in shamanism, which was humanity's first religion, and for most of human history, the religion of our hunter and gatherer ancestors? Absolutely. Um, shamanism, let's, let's look at the definition of it. The uh, famous Greek uh, anthropologist, Mercedes Eliade, defined shamanism as archaic techniques of ecstasy. And here, he was not referring to the current, the modern drug ecstasy, but rather okay. to the Greek root word of ecstasis, flight of the soul. So ancient techniques for the flight of the soul. Why was this so important in shamanism? Because unlike in our contemporary materialistic sense-based worldview, in the shamanic worldview, there was the natural world, the everyday world. But there was also the upper world where the um, gods and goddesses dwelled and the powers that controlled our fates. And there was the underworld where our ancestors existed. So the role of the shaman was to travel into the supernatural realm, either into the upper world or into the lower world and to bring back uh, a boon to humanity, uh, to bring us into connection with our ancestors for divination, for healing, yeah. and to bring good hunt and to bring rain. So not all forms of shamanism relied on psychedelics, but because these psychedelic plants, which must have seemed like a magical portal to the mm. supernatural world, to our, uh, our ancient ancestors, we find this in many, uh, in many, many forms of, of shamanism. Among the reindeer herders of Siberia, who use the Amanita muscaria mushroom, who are considered to be the fathers of shamanism. Among the Mazatecs of Mexico, who use uh, the psilocybin mushrooms uh, for healing. Yeah. Among the wise women of Europe, who were the repository of this ancient wisdom, um, until they were repressed by the Inquisition, uh, who were aware of this and many other herbal uh, medicines. Among the Bwiti of uh, Central Africa, who used the Ibogaine plant, which is now showing to be itself to be successful in helping people overcome addiction. Wow. Among the uh, Aborigines of Australia, the ayahuasca users of um, of uh, the Brazilian and the Peruvian and the Ecuadorian Amazon and ayahuasca today, as you may be well aware, yep. is sort of exploded out of the Amazon and is attracting people from all over the world because of its of its healing uh, powers. So certainly, uh, shamanism and is is the the role of sacred plants is mm. very uh, ingrained in uh, shamanism, which was the, the worldwide religion of our hunting and gathering fathers. There was no centralized doctrine of shamanism. Many different peoples decentralized all over the world uh, adopted this form of belief. Wow, that is really fast. You know, I know there is an increase in ayahuasca lately. Um, DMT is another one that is starting to kind of get a little bit of, uh, of notoriety, but um, yeah, you know, shamanism is something that's really fascinating to me. It's almost these guides that can take you to different places or can help you on a journey to see the world as more connected. And the thing I love about the experiences I'm reading from people is that uh, there's typically a sense of beauty and closeness to the earth and appreciation and joy and increase in color and feeling more connected to the senses. You know, this is not a for people that kind of have a stigma of mushrooms being this just unfamiliar or even criminal activity, 
the results of people that are really being healed from it are, are pretty fascinating, pretty beautiful. I mean, it's, you don't have cases of people losing their minds and, you know, like it's, it's most of the experiences that I've been reading about are people having very positive experiences that are re- relevatory to something spiritual or mystical. Um, and so one of the things that I was also consider, you know, in your book, you do have, uh, you and Julie have gone to great lengths to produce these really beautiful photographs of some of the artwork in these churches that you guys have, have in cathedrals have traveled through. Um, and I'm curious if, you know, if psychedelic plants were so often depicted in medieval Christian art, and they're still visible today in some of these cathedrals, why aren't the psychedelic gospels more widely known and accepted? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, if you look at Rosalind Chapel, uh, which is uh, from the 1400s. It was built between 1440 and 1480 uh, by Sir William Sinclair. Hmm. Um, it's been there for 500 years. Why has no one looked at it, seen what we've seen before? Hmm. Um, because art historians, Christian theologians, um, tour guides um, have are not trained church historians are not trained in mycology or ethnobotany they don't it's a field they're not familiar with there there had been no reason for them to be trained in it so they even in looking at these they would not see it they do not have the background to see it let me give you an example from the great canterbury psalter which is a magnificent illuminated prayer book uh, from the, uh, it started in 1180 in the Canterbury Scriptorum where, where, where Bibles and prayer books were made. Sure. And the first folio, these are gold filigree um, uh, imageries, imageries, illuminations. And the opening folio of this magnificent uh, prayer book uh, is from Genesis. And in the third um, illustration, there's God creating plants. But when you look at it, uh, and the image in our book is actually God is creating psychedelic mushrooms because God has created a red, white dotted Amanita muscaria mushroom. Hmm. He's created a blue psilocybin mushroom because as people who study mushrooms know that psilocybin, that the psychoactive properties in psilocybin, both psilocybin and psilocin, t- turn blue when they're oxidized, when they're exposed to air. Hmm. And there are two other psilocybin-like mushrooms. In the next image where the God, we see actual plants and the mushrooms. So the artist is telling us that they knew the difference between actual green plants and these psilocybin mushrooms. There's another fascinating image um, that goes on in the great Canterbury Psalter where Jesus has now been baptized and he's now out on his healing mission. And in this famous uh, image, there's Jesus healing the leper. And Jesus has his hands on the leper's head. And there are two scrolls in Latin. One comes from the leper's left hand, and it goes not to Jesus, but to a psilocybin mushroom. Hmm. And it says, as we translate the Latin, you know, master, if you will, cleanse me. And the scroll from Jesus's hand goes to the back of the leper, and it says, I will be cleansed. Well, this Hmm. is phenomenal. Now, when I've asked uh, Arthur Morgan, who is a professor emeritus of art history at Cambridge University, who wrote a commentary on the Canterbury, uh, on the great Canterbury Psalter, uh, you know, Professor Morgan, what do you think about these mushrooms? And his response was very honest. You know, he took his, his, his Psalter out. He looked at it, he says, Jerry, I wouldn't know a mushroom if I saw one. Hmm. And so this is not um, covering up. This is not ingenuousness, disingenuous. It's just that art historians are not prepared uh, to see this. This is why this is such an interdisciplinary study where I, in my own study and teaching on psychedelics and culture, and I've taught a course from that at my university, Florida International University of Miami, since 1975, you need to approach it from a, an interdisciplinary uh, basis. And this is why we're creating an interdisciplinary committee on um, the entheogenic research to bring together art historians, church scholars, theologians, 
uh, psychedelic researchers to mm. go out and evaluate the psychedelic gospel because obviously this is a controversial theory sure and we would like it to move it into the mainstream of christian and academic discussion yep uh, and we think that the door may be opening uh, there is a quote in our book from brother david stindel ross who is from the order of saint benedict and he says if we can encounter god through a sunrise seen from a mountaintop why not through a mushroom prayerfully ingested that is such a beautiful quote i've never heard that before and uh, i'll talk about my experience here in a minute but i'm kind of curious um there seems to be a new trend among scholars that are calling these psychoactive plants entheogens meaning god generated within rather than even psychedelic or hallucinogenic plants um and I'm, I'm curious why that is a case. And do you think that this is maybe different, uh, what we're seeing now in this psychedelic renaissance? Is it different than, than the movement from the 60s? Uh, it's, it's dramatically different because, look, what happened in the 60s was Timothy Leary and others, uh, in the context, in the cyclotron of the civil rights movement, of the anti-war protests, um, they, they were you know, looking at this as a mass movement that could really change uh, people's minds, change the framework in which people approach society. And sure. at that time, President Nixon called Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America. But what happened uh, from the, the proselytizing that Leary and his followers did, and the backlash to it, was that all of the research, the serious scientific research, uh, from the 1940s, 1950s, early 60s that went on, where there were over a thousand peer-reviewed papers published mm -hmm. uh, documenting research with psychedelics on some 40,000 human subjects that showed great promise. That all got washed away in the mm -hmm. hysteria around psychedelic drugs that happened in the 60s. And there's a very important point here because um, Ehrlichman, uh, one of, of Nixon's two uh, you know, chiefs of staff and, and right-hand men, okay. shortly before his death, said, look, we knew these drugs were not harmful. We had a political problem. We had a, a civil rights movement, and we had an anti-war movement. And we knew we could not make it illegal to be black, and we knew it could, we couldn't make it illegal to protest the war. But we knew by banning these drugs, which happened in the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, that we would have a tool to, to prosecute the leaders of these movements and to go in and to undermine them. So it was really a horrible political decision that led to this entire war, war on drugs that has led today to many people who have not been harmful to society to being uh, incarcerated in the lives of many uh, youth being destroyed, uh, high rates of black and Latinos in prison, losing their right to vote. The reason mm. that Carl Rook, the eminent classical uh, scholar and writer on psychedelics, and uh, others chose this word in theogen, which means God generated within, was to get away from the stigma that the word psychedelics had from the 60s. Okay. And what's different um, he, in the psychedelic renaissance is that just as we've seen with medical marijuana, there is research being done at majors universities, John Hopkins, which has gotten millions of dollars in funding for the first official university psychedelic research center, mm. uh, NYU, UCLA, and other places that now they're following the very rigorous FDA, Food and Drug Administration, three-stage um, research protocol to yeah. test and evaluate the impact of these psychedelics to help with depression, to help with addiction, to help with uh, my cluster headaches, to help with end-of-life anxiety. Yep. And when people see that these things can really he help people, well then, uh, legalization, as we've seen in uh, marijuana cannabis, follows um, medicalization. Yeah. And people say, well, you know, this can truly be helpful. Uh, this is the kind of thing that inspired Ron Dreher, 
who is a uh, conservative Catholic. He's the editor of American Conservative. He wrote an article in 2018 uh, in the American Conservative called A Christian Approach to Psychedelic. And he's the mm -hmm. senior editor of the American Conservative. And oh, wow. basically, he's saying, basically he's saying, look, I'm writing a long letter to Christians here. I'd like you to take some time, sit down and read it. Uh, because one, and I quote, we should not, he's saying we should not no longer dismiss psychedelics out of hand, not for the sake of treating those suffering from mental disorder or terminal illness, and also for those interesting in studying consciousness. And we as Christians are interested in healing and the relief of suffering. Yeah. And we also see that this is psychedelics and the mystical experience surrounding psychedelics um, is compatible with the metaphysics of the Christian tradition that indicate that, you know, that religious experience is tied to the mystical experience. So yes. psychedelics drugs may reveal this truth in a different way. This is a long step from saying that Christianity has a psychedelic history, which is what our work is arguing, but it certainly offers a new opening to the Christian community yeah. uh, and another approach to, uh, to psychedelics. You know, um, this will be a very novice argument on my end, because this is a whole new world to me, but one of the conversations I've been having recently is just uh, around, especially in the, the circles that I've traveled in for so long, which is kind of evangelical Christianity, there seems to be such a, um, a misconception and an underappreciation and a, and a morality issue over mushrooms or even marijuana uh, yet we have no problem taking a, a concoction of chemicals that are formed in labs to help get rid of headaches or uh, even people that are daily addicted to caffeine to get their day going. They need some sort of drug to get them actually moving in the morning. And yet there's these natural substances that many consider gifts from God that are growing in nature that... Um, you know, with ayahuasca and and some of this other, you know, marijuana and and mushrooms and uh, a little bit of my backstory is this is all new to me. But uh, recently, just yeah, you know, I've been dealing with some some depression, and we don't know. We're trying to get to the source of it, and it's been eight years or so coming. And I think a lot of it is job related and career related, and and also living in the Pacific Northwest where it's gray quite a bit. But um, I had somebody who who uh, suggested, somebody who I, I really deeply care about that suggested um, potentially trying mushrooms and said, hey, I'll help you out and I want to guide you through this. I think it'll be a big help to you. Uh, and I've seen a massive change in this particular individual over the last year or so. Uh, and and this person attributes it completely, or not completely, but mostly to to mushrooms. And so I took this person up on their offer and went out to the woods a couple weeks ago and... and uh, and this person gave me a, a dose of mushrooms and it was nothing. I mean, it was not as a, as a person who in the past has had a, had a decent, re, uh, I would say a healthy in one sense, but unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Um, I remember telling my wife, I'd much rather my kids do mushrooms than even drink because I didn't know what to expect going in. I thought I was going to be like chased by a velociraptor or something. It was, it just was amazing how much of my own anxious projections I threw upon mushrooms. And when I took them, I was out in nature and things were beautiful. And it was the first time I sat next to a river for three hours and just smiled. And I noticed the color and the pattern of sound in the water and the birds were flying. And I saw their, the bellies of them as, they, as the sun hit them. They just sparkle silver like glitter. And I walked away from the mushroom experience thinking... This is, this is beautiful, and I see the world the way it, it almost felt like. Maybe this is what Eden was like, and uh, and so I'm wondering, like, are you advocating that that psychedelic drugs like ayahuasca or LSD or mescaline or even some of these uh, psilocybin mushrooms be legalized, similar to the way in which marijuana has been legalized for medical purposes or even in some states recreational use? Yeah, but with with the caveat that these should be done by healthy people, not yeah. by people who have emotional problems or who are tremendously fragile, mm. um, adults in um, sacred settings 
yes. with the availability of guides if people would um, need a guide. Some people find that there is a God within them. Some people find there is a spiritual guide within them and they don't need uh, external guides. Mm -hmm. So we think that um, yes, in the same way that the right to use um, peyote has been granted to members of the Native American church of yep. indigenous people, and the same way that US participants in the Brazilian based uh, Santo Dime church, which uses ayahuasca, which contains yeah. the psychoactive DMT, have a legal right now under the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act to use psychedelics in the religious rituals. Uh, you know, what about the rest of us? What about the millions of people who've tried psychedelics uh, who don't need medical assistance, who don't need psychological assistance? What about the the uh, the Silicon Valley and high tech CEOs who are taking micro doses of psilocybin and LSD illegally because it helps enhance creativity. Yeah. What about the 27% of Americans who in the Pew Center religious survey say they are spiritual, but not religious, some of whom want to explore psychedelics as a pathway to God. Shouldn't we as a right of religious freedom have affordable and legal access to uh, psilocybin and other sacred plants. And the whole point of this concept in Theogen uh, to talk about sacred plants that generate the divine within is to get away from the stigma. These are not drugs in the way that we think about alcohol or Correct. nicotine or, or cocaine. Sure. And the medical and scientific research is certainly uh, backing that up. Um, I fell into when I, Julie and I moved, retired and moved out of the United States to Europe. I, to my surprise, fell into a deep depression. Hmm. And uh, I've not been a depressed person in my life. I've been blessed with good brain chemistry. Yeah. But what happened to me was that I had had a very, uh, you know, good career. I was, uh, appreciated by my students, by my colleagues in the environmental movement, uh, a lot of plaudits for my work as Dr. Brown in the energy and renewable energy and anti-nuclear area. And all of a sudden I thought like, my God, what have I done? I've taken myself away from everything that's um, given me a lot of pleasure and, and to be very yeah. honest, ego gratification. And sure. I fell into a deep depression. I wanted to go back to the States I was driving my wife crazy who thought, you know, at last we'll have our, our golden years together. Nothing okay. helped me. No psychotherapy. Uh, I saw a psychiatrist. No antidepressants helped me. Mm. I tried uh, uh, EMDMR, EMDR, electric emotional freedom technique from a psychotherapist. I tried meditation techniques. I found an ayahuasca retreat center here in Europe. And I was so fragile that like you, I thought the giant anaconda would, would come out of the forest and devour me. I was yeah. scared to death of going, but in a four hour ayahuasca session at a retreat center, um, I saw my, that I was a prisoner of my ego, mm. that I didn't know how to enjoy this new stage of our life because I was trapped in my ego. And my prison bars kind of shattered like shards around me. Uh, wow. I saw what I was actually doing that was harming my, my beloved wife. And finally, I saw that the depression, I, I, I visualized it as a black snake inside of me. And I literally, in the hallucination of the ayahuasca session, pulled it out of me and flung it away. And I woke up the next morning and the depression was gone in wow. one session. So I, I resonate with what you're saying. The experience you had with nature is very much what uh, Albert Hoffman, the first person to synthesize LSD and the first person to ever have an LSD uh, experience said, you know, it just opens our eyes. It brings us back into connection with nature. And this cleansing of the doors of perception is why Aldous Huxley uh, called his book the doors of perception. You know, it opens mm. our eyes to see the world as we originally saw it before all of these constructs of culture 
and worries about today and tomorrow and making a living were kind of imposed upon us uh, and not letting us truly be uh, in the moment. And as Julie and I say in the uh, invitation to readers at the beginning of our book, The Psychedelic Gospels, and I quote, um, it was through entheogens that we first came to experience God as the divine intelligence that permeates the universe. Mm. So certainly this opens us up to a different view than the stigmatized view of psychedelics that's come down and been pervasive from the Nixon years and the Reagan just say no years. And fortunately, uh, Denver has decriminalized, uh, Oak, Oakland has decriminalized, Santa Cruz oh, wow. has decriminalized, and there are initiatives on the ballot in California and Oregon to also decriminalize uh, psychedelics for therapeutic uh, purposes. That's beautiful. Like I said, it was for me, it was an experience of feeling like all my senses were firing and that the trees were more green. The moss was, the moss was like, a, it reminded me of the movie Avatar where everything just was alive. And it, and it was just really a beautiful, a beautiful experience. Why did the evidence of entheogens in Christian art end around kind of the 1500s? Yeah, uh, this is a really good question. And we, um, we think it's because of the, of the, um, of the Inquisition, Inquisition, because of the Christian Catholic Inquisition. Okay. And we came upon this idea uh, in Prague, where we saw uh, on our research journey, uh, we found a statue of St. George um, slaying the dragon. And around the base of the dragon were numerous psychoactive Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Hmm. So we ask in our books, what, and I quote, what, what does St. George the Dragon Slayer and the 15th century witch hunts have in common? Nothing at all, you might assume. But okay. historically, the myth of St. George and the Dragon, and as we shall soon see, the Catholic Church's inquisition against heresy and paganism are linked to the gruesome nexus of the Black Death. This was, and we are now living a, a global pandemic that no one could have very few people could have imagined in our lifetime. The Black Death was the most lethal disaster in human history. Hmm. It killed up to 60% of the population of Europe in a very, very short period of time from 1347 to 1352. According to a historian, Barbara Touchman, this was, quote, a violent, tormented, bewildered, suffering, and disintegrating age, a time as many thought of Satan uh, triumphant. Hmm. The church, which was supposedly had the medieval church, the hotline to God, was getting as sick as everyone else. It could not protect people. So the church looked for scapegoats. They persecuted the Jews. The Inquisition, the, the plagues persisted. And so uh, through a papal bull, up until that time, witchcraft, oh, they poisoned my well, oh, they put a curse on my crops, sure. was a civil crime, punishable by, by civil punishments. Under the papal bull, witchcraft became a heresy, punishable by death. And this developed over the years. Now we see the, the image of the uh, satanic witch developing. Yeah. And this is the time where the horn god of shamanism becomes the horn devil of Christianity. And it is also the time when the folk healers of and village sorcerers of pastoral Europe are condemned as satanic witches and burned at the stake by the tens of thousands. And the majority of people burned and condemned for witchcraft were women, about 85%, according to one study that went into the church uh, records of that time. So in through the uh, 14th and 15th and 16th century, when we saw the height of the witch craze, it was due to the uh, Catholic Inquisition that uh, these images now that were in the churches were seen as pagan and they, they fall off after this period. How do you think this all relates to the thing we're experiencing here in 2020, the coronavirus? 
Well, this is a, a very different plague. This is a new uh, virus that humanity's never been exposed to before. We don't have any immunity. We're just learning about it. And you can see all the fear that there is out there and the anxiety and the xenophobia um, and, and the, you know, condemnation of the Chinese and persecution of Chinese or Asian looking people. So we're afraid even in this time, imagine what it was like at the time of the Black Plague in your village. You had no internet, you had no news, you had no germ theory of, of medicine. So people search for an explanation sure. and you know, to allay their fears and they found it in, in blaming the witches. Uh, for it, who were actually up to that time, the wise women of Europe who, you know, were involved in midwifery, they were involved in healing, they were involved in aphrodisiacs, they were mm. involved in uh, a variety of herbs that can cure people. And they were the sort of the inheritors, the repository of this long tradition of shamanism because the witches were also a form of, of shaman. We can un well understand why something like a pandemic that we cannot control that is growing exponentially that has devastated uh, parts of China that is now out of control in Italy and that they predict can in Germany they're saying it can affect 60 or 70 percent of the population and maybe that in the US we can yeah. see why why this is fearful and why in the middle middle ages uh, it would have caused great uh, consternation and um, the church would have exerted its power at that time by finding and condemning the witches as the scapegoat and the cause of this. Wow, that is really fascinating. Okay, last question, and this was uh, this was not this is off off this is off the cuff, so no pressure. But you know, the question I would ask you is maybe there's somebody that's listened to the show that has been raised in a religious or maybe not even religious setting, but has kind of had some. Uh, presumptions as to mushrooms and and what they are and how they've been used and they have knowledge of what's happened in the 60s what what encouragement would you give to somebody who is um who is now maybe curious and wants to explore next steps or like i mean obviously i'm going to send them to read the psychedelic gospels but is there anything else that you would uh as somebody who's done a lot of research in this, point people towards or ask them to consider? Michael Pollan's best-selling book, How to Change Your Mind, What the New Science of Psychedelic Tells Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, it was published in 2018, and since Michael Pollan was a well-known best-selling author who's written on food and the evolution of food, and food and humanity, he got on all the major talk shows. So he has done a great deal with this book hmm. to open up the conversation about the, the scientific uses of psychedelics and what's happening in the psychedelic renaissance. That's okay. number one. Number two, I suggest that they take a look at Ron Dreher, the senior editor of American Conservatives essay, A Christian Approach to Psychedelics. It's a long, and thoughtful essay uh, looking at psychedelics in light of this new evidence and why Christians should become open to uh, looking at this in a new way. Mm. And then um, the third thing is MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, maps.org. And MAPS is sort of uh, the mother church or the mothership, so to speak, <laughs> for the psychedelic renaissance. MAPS is a nonprofit organization that has funded and sponsored and advocated uh, a lot of the scientific research. They have been the people who have uh, presented the evidence that has gotten the FDA to qualify ecstasy and psilocybin as breakthrough therapies mm -hmm. because they offer such promise for helping people overcome depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, anxiety for terminal illness. So MAPS is a great place where you can find all of the current and uh, recent uh, evidence on the scientific breakthroughs in psychedelics. Thank you so much for the effort that you have put in, not only just in, in preparing for this podcast, but also the research that you and Julie did and traveling 
around Europe and, and really trying to assess what's going on and make sense of it. And so I just want to say thank you for that. And thanks for joining me on Heath and Pursuit today. Thanks for your openness to this conversation and the intelligent questions that you brought to it. Well, of course, what an honor it was to have you on the show. If you're interested in the work of Dr. Jerry or Julie Brown, um, you can visit their website, which is psychedelicgospels.com. Um, again, that's psychedelicgospels.com. And if you're interested in the book, The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens and Christianity, that is available on Amazon. And it is really a fun book that kind of will crack your brain a little bit and hopefully remove some of the stigma that you might have about hallucinogenic mushrooms. I hope this show was fun for you today. And uh, if you would not mind leaving me a review on iTunes or on Spotify or any of those. That really does help get this show out to some new people, and I'm always encouraged by that. Recently just had a review from Plays With Fire that says, Heath's search for what is true and lovely has been rolling around in his heart since we met. The hints of devastation that this life and what the Bible points to are like a rogue line of code that causes jitter to our preferred programming. How does the story really go? I'm looking forward to more episodes. So uh, what a sweet response. Again, if you haven't left a review on iTunes, that does really help uh, me in getting this show out to some people that might have not heard it. And I think it's a fun show. All right. It's a beautiful day in the Pacific Northwest, which is a rare thing to say. And so I'm going to take my kids down to the beach and we're going to go play. Maybe I'll take a mushroom or two along. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Heath in Pursuit podcast. We look forward to being back with you next week. For more information on the various works of Heath Hollandsby, please visit heathinpursuit.com.